Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ian Chubb. I'm uh, what in this country you would call the president of the Australian National University. Um, in my country, I get called many different things um, uh, as a consequence of that job, but uh, one of them is that I'm Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University, and we always have to explain this small cultural difference uh, when we travel abroad uh, to any country other than England. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, I'd like to offer you on behalf of the uh, uh, ANU a uh, great big thank you for coming out today. We know that... Um, uh, you're busy, it's the beginning of your uh, semester. Um, ours starts uh, uh, early in February, our academic year starts early in February, so um, uh, we have a little more time to concentrate on things other than uh, making sure that we can fit all the students into the classrooms that we have available. So we appreciate your uh, coming today. And um, in particular, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Carol Gluck, Myron Cohen and their colleagues at the Weatherhead East Asian Institute here at Columbia um, for their uh, assistance and uh, cooperation in uh, establishing this program and enabling us to be here. Um, our Consul General uh, um, uh, will uh, uh, to New York will be here soon and um, uh, were he here now I would welcome him. Um, I will welcome him, him when welcome. I see him later. Um, but uh, he is a very active participant in activities that we at ANU engage in when we come to this part of the world uh, during this week uh, for each of the last five years. Um, the, the event, of course, itself would not be what it is without the support of the Weatherhead Institute. And, um, and we are hoping uh, that there will be many more events like this uh, during the coming years. <laughs> Uh, and that we hope also that we will have the opportunity to welcome you to uh, Australia and particularly to the ANU uh, in the near future. Now, understanding China is an important part of the work we do at ANU. Um, I'll just give you a few words on the uh, history of our institution uh, because it actually does reflect on, on some of the capacities we have there, uh, which we um, like to or, and used to enable us to work with colleagues, particularly in other countries, so that the different perspectives on, on uh, our particular region, because we live there, um, and, and how uh, that region is seen uh, by scholars uh, in different parts of the world. The ANU was established immediately after the Second World War and it had a particular brief to introduce research capability into Australia. Uh, it was set up at a particular time when there were particular um, emphases uh, being given around the world to medical research, to physics, uh, physical sciences and so on. But one of our um, particular briefs was to build scholarly capacity on the Asia-Pacific region. And the reason for that was pretty straightforward. Uh, in the lead up to the Second World War, it became pretty clear that Australia that had very tight ties to Britain had very few ties, if any ties at all, uh, to our region. So we didn't understand it, we didn't understand what was happening in any deep, uh, deeply profound way, uh, and the consequences for us as a nation were quite substantial. Uh, immediately after the war, the government, as part of the post-war reconstruction effort, decided that it was uh, something that they would not like to see happen again, consequences of which they established a very substantial research program into Asia Pacific uh, when they established the Australian National University. Um, that obligation continues. Uh, we um, have shifted focus, of course, as the uh, foci within our region have changed. And um, we most recently have built and had granted by our government, our federal government, a substantial grant to establish a, a China centre for the study of China in the world. And I should just emphasise one thing that uh, and that is that when it was established, the government was quite determined um, and spent quite a bit of time emphasising the yin in the title of this centre. So it wasn't just more studies of China. It was actually about the role that China was beginning to play in the world at large. So it was much more global in orientation, the influence, the activities, the, the contributions um, that China has made and is making uh, to the world as we know it and the world as we know it is changing, and, and uh, the influence that China has on those changes. So it's 
very much studying China and its role and its role in the world and, uh, and it's very much part of our much uh, larger commitment, of course, to studies of Asia and the Pacific. So our uh, mission, uh, in that broad sense, is not all that uh, dissimilar uh, from that of the Weatherhead Institute, and so it's one of the reasons why we're, we're very pleased to be here today, uh, very pleased to be able to talk to you, uh, very pleased to be able to uh, listen to what colleagues will say and then uh, engage in a question and answer session. So uh, I hope uh, that you enjoy it. I thank you again for coming. I thank you again, uh, colleagues from Columbia, for making it possible. And I look forward to listening to, because I'm personally a physiologist, not a, uh, not a uh, China expert. So I learn something from these every time I come to them. And I go to a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank you for joining uh, uh, today's panel discussion. I am Myron Cohen, director of the Weather at East Asian Institute. And on behalf of our institute and Columbia University as a whole, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to uh, Vice Chancellor Chubb and to our other colleagues from the Australian National University. The many linkages between ANU and Columbia in the area of uh, China and East Asian studies extend well back into the previous century, and today's event expresses their ongoing importance for both universities. So we are delighted to host this group of scholars and anticipate an exciting dialogue <laughs> on the China and trans-Pacific trans relationships <laughs> that will shape regional and indeed global architecture of the 21st century. The timing of today's event could not be more appropriate. Um, our panel discussion moderator is Dean Andrew McIntyre of the College of Asia and the Pacific at ANU. Professor McIntyre's research focuses on the political economy of Southeast Asia and Australian foreign policy interests in the Asia-Pacific region. He is an active member of the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue and sits on the advisory boards of the Australia-American Education Leadership Foundation. Uh, and uh, I now turn over the, uh, the podium to Professor McIntyre, who will briefly introduce the panelists before we begin the discussion. Professor McIntyre. Myron, thanks very much. Um, uh, let me just briefly uh, uh, echo the, uh, um, the sentiments uh, expressed by both Myron and uh, Ian. Uh, we at ANU are really pleased to have this chance uh, to explore possibilities for a bit more structured intellectual engagement uh, between the large uh, uh, collection of scholars working on uh, Asia here at Columbia uh, and the large collection of scholars uh, working on Asia uh, at ANU. And we see today as uh, perhaps the beginning of something a bit more structured. Um, uh, the, format, uh, the format for today is we're going to start, try, we're trying to keep it informal. I'm going to start with me just put, putting some uh, questions to uh, uh, the panellists, and they'll jump in and interpret those uh, as they will. Um, uh, and then uh, after a while, we'll open up to uh, uh, discussion with the floor, and people can uh, put questions, comments, propositions uh, of all sorts. It's a broad-ranging panel. Uh, I won't uh, go through in detail uh, the, uh, 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 the bios on people. You've, you've got that in the program. But just, uh, uh, just briefly, um, uh, Charles Morrison, Professor of... Uh, Korean Studies uh, in the Social Sciences here at Columbia. Uh, moving along, uh, Jeremy Barme, Professor Jeremy Barme, who's director of uh, our new Australian Centre on China and the World that uh, Ian mentioned. Um, we can skip over me. Um, uh, uh, Andy Nathan, uh, class of 1919, Professor of Political Science here at uh, Columbia. Uh, Professor Richard Rigby, uh, who heads our uh, ANU uh, China Centre um, uh, and previously had a life... Uh, uh, in government as a, as a, as a diplomat. Yes, and um, uh, Professor uh, Madeline Zellin, uh, mm -hmm. Professor of Chinese Studies here at Columbia. For full details, see the program. Um, <laughs> well, w why don't we uh, dive in, because we've, we've, we've had a slightly late start and people have all got bit busy schedules. Um, perhaps the place to start, uh, Myron, I think you, uh, you, you observed our timing is good for an event like this, uh, given what's happening this week, uh, given the big uh, 
uh, meetings yesterday um, uh, with uh, uh, the President uh, and Secretary Hu. Um, so just put, put to the panel, what, what are people's opening impressions <coughs> of this visit? Is it sort of roughly as you expected? Any surprises in it yet? Uh, and what, what do you think might come out of the visit? And just please feel free to jump in in any order and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take it informally. I'll, I'll steer traffic to the extent that's needed. Actually, that's what Strange feeling. And if you don't jump in, we'll We're call you the alphabetically. The <laughs> then, I, I'll, st I'll start off with perfectly vapid, vapid remarks then. That, 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 uh, diplomats are good. So far, yeah, well, absolutely, a, a lifetime doing it, um, li <laughs> lying abroad for my country. Uh, but, um, and that's lying, not, anyway, that's cool. <laughs> we won't go there. Uh, so far, no surprises, and, and I think that's a good thing, and with this sort of visit, you don't want <laughs> surprises. Uh, clearly, a great deal of work has gone into the visit on both sides. Uh, I, I gather from, from one or two voices I've picked up in, in, in Washington that some people uh, were not necessarily happy with the degree of ceremonial uh, uh, given to the visit. After all, these people uh, uh, are people who are causing problems in the United States, who perhaps encapsulate or, 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 or act uh, in ways which are not generally seem to be very nice and so on and so forth. So what are we doing uh, treating uh, their leader with uh, such a high degree of respect? I think that's a completely wrong way of looking at it. I think it's entirely appropriate that uh, the leader of a country as important as China is treated with every degree of respect and all due ceremonial and a state visit after all is a state visit and it's not only respect to the particular individual or the party that they, they, they represent or the government they represent but to the country as a whole and the relationship between <coughs> China and the United States is certainly where Australia is concerned by far the most important bilateral relationship in the world and that which is, is, is shaping the future of the world uh, in, in, in ways which have enormous importance for all of us. So despite the differences and despite the difficulties, and we've certainly seen plenty of them, particularly over the last year or so, just the fact that they are sitting down together and uh, treating one another as, I think, increasingly, and this is particularly where the United States is concerned, increasingly treating the United States as, uh, treating China as an equal. Now, of course, in, U.S. government would say it's always treated China as an equal, but I think increasingly, as, as with, with the growth of China's uh, uh, wealth and power, to use an old expression, uh, the, the realities of this are being borne in more and more to the point where uh, China really is being treated as, as an equal, which, in, 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 of course, is part of the problematic, because we are now looking at a change in, in the power relationships in the world, and particularly in the Asia Pacific, which is most concerned to Australia. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up now. I just say I think it's a very good thing that it's happening. I don't think we should expect any any surprises. If there were surprises, it would not be such a good thing. Now, an American has to speak. Wow, well, we can't let Jeremy speak. That would be two Australians in a row. So, <clears throat> I agree with Richard that the U.S. is now in a new phase of its China strategy, which is trying to find a way to accommodate or come to terms with a China that has risen. I think we're no longer really talking about a rising China or engaging China in order to turn it into a status quo power or a democracy, but we have to come to terms with the fact that China now is a major power. This has been going on for a while. It's not just this year. But we're still trying to find that equilibrium with this rising power in a, a way that <clears throat> accommodates what the U.S. would view as China's legitimate interests while still not lying down and being run over by the runaway locomotive of Chinese power in various spheres. And I think the Obama administration in the first two years, well, even in the Bush administration, we heard the slogan, responsible stakeholder. That was the Bush administration strategy offering China a role, saying, you know, we're not trying to... Uh, encircle you. We're not trying to prevent you from rising, but we want you to accept a certain niche in the international system that we define as that of a responsible stakeholder. And I think the Chinese were <clears throat> actually up, up taking that role. You know, the, the, after studying what that meant, I think they were uh, 
partly willing to perform the role of a responsible stakeholder, but not necessarily to perform it just the way the U.S. defined it, you know, that responsible is when you do, when you vote for all of our resolutions in the Security Council, when you peg your currency at the rate that we want you to peg it at. The Chinese were saying, we're responsible, but we will define what that should be. And then when the Obama administration came in, I think they sort of inherited that concept. They brought up a new slogan, which I can't remember. It's not as poetic as responsible stakeholder. But uh, does anybody remember it? It was a different two-word phrase, but it meant the same thing. And Obama, <clears throat> I think, said, did what he said, which was that he was reaching out the hand of partnership to anybody who da 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 da. So he was hoping that if we treated the Chinese government very respectfully, then uh, they would fall into line. But what we've seen, I think, is Beijing misinterpreting the, that as weakness, misinterpreting the U.S. as economically weak, which is understandable that one might draw that conclusion, um, although I don't think it's really true, misinterpreting the U.S. as losing its will and overstretched militarily, which I also think is not really correct and misinterpreting the U.S. As, as basically giving up on itself and not daring to talk about human rights or to really compete in the area of soft power anymore. And they saw the U.S. in decline, partly because many American commentators talk about the decline of the United States and the Chinese read those things. So I think the Chinese began to push, push with these incidents we've seen uh, around the Senkaku Islands, the South China Sea, push with their uh, sort of, uh, I would say, overheated response to the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, pushing their luck, uh, so to speak, with economic things, with this indigenous innovation policy, and not taking seriously the American demands on the currency and things like this. So I think the Obama administration has decided to <clears throat> set some boundaries to be a little tougher. And I think they handled it quite skillfully by firing off all these softening up salvos in advance, uh, uh, some of them in public and I'm sure some in private, although I, I don't know what those were, but there were a series of visits of American officials uh, the, over to China probably laying down our position. There was Hillary's statement at the ASEAN foreign minister meeting that the U.S. has an interest in the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. There were speeches in the week or so pr previous to the Senate about every issue that's on the agenda. And I think, you know, so G uh, Gates's speech, Hillary's speech about human rights, Geithner's speech about economic relations. So they were sent, the administration sent very clear, unambiguous signals to the Chinese right up front what's going to be on our agenda. There cannot have been any surprises, I think, to the Chinese side, and the Chinese were able to prepare. And I think they've prepared their, their answers. And um, <clears throat> I especially, I haven't seen the press, I haven't had time to really catch up, but I saw the headline. And clearly, the Chinese carefully thought through what their answer was going to be on the issue of human rights in particular and gave, you know, I think they gave a skillful answer. So I think both sides handled the summit in a skillful manner that they each put their stuff on the agenda. Neither side surprised the other side with uh, its position. But I think from an American point of view, it was important that we asserted, you know, our claim that we are not in decline, that we have our legitimate security interests that go across a wide range, and that we're not going to um, give up advocating for ourselves. I think that the U.S. government does a lot of things at many levels, and the presidential level is a level for laying down this kind of strategic direction, and I think that's what was done. You want to ask a different no, question? Just, just right. seeing if anyone else wants me, to come in on it before I move it around. On? Is this on? Yeah, yeah. it is. <clears throat> well, I, I, w I was one. I mean, I'd actually like to usurp your mm. your authority for a moment mm, and, and ask the the panel, all of whom I think um, have focused <laughs> largely on you know the 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 
the commanding heights. I mean, they're looking at the direct uh, government-to-government -government relationship and the ways in which those uh, relationships are being articulated in the uh, run-up to, to this visit. But I'm wondering how, whether, you know, we've been through several of these visits. I mean, in, in, in my lifetime, certainly, as, as a scholar, um, I remember, you know, Deng Xiaoping's visit. I'm that old, and I remember um, the subsequent visits and the, and the curiosity and excitement of the people, the, a sense of China as being something that we don't really understand, something very exotic. And this visit seems kind of a little bit flat. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the United States at the moment that, that's occupying people's attention, the, the Tucson matter and the health care bill. And I'm just curious whether you think that there's been a change in the general perception of China itself beyond simply, you know, China is stealing our jobs, the health care bill is stealing our jobs, everybody's stealing our jobs, um, and, and seeing China in a, in a sense as more regularized, more normalized as part of, you know, sort of the various things that are going on, or is there still that exoticism and, uh, and, and I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but last night I was shocked just as I was going to bed watching MSNBC. I happened to turn on when they were talking about Rush Limbaugh's reflections on this meeting. I don't know if anybody saw it. Well, I mean, it was, it was kind of scary to me because it was, I mean, basically what he did was he sat there and imitated his sense of a Chinese person speaking Chinese, giving the sense that, you know, we are still, you know, this is still an incomprehensible group of people. This is still something that we really should be afraid of and distance ourselves from. And so I'm wondering, those of you who, who watch these relationships, whether you get a sense of where the American people are in all of this. Mm. Uh, I just want to address that briefly. I, I have to admit I don't ra watch Rush Limbaugh <laughs> regularly. <laughs> and I, I, if I could help it. <laughs> and I would like to believe that Rush Limbaugh does not reflect the opinion of the majority of the American people, but I, I could be wrong there. Uh, I do think, I, I think the American perception of China is, is becoming very complicated. Uh, it's interesting that we are in this point of uh, economic downturn uh, with China seeming so strong, and there isn't a lot of China bashing. It's not like the view of Japan of the 1980s. So I, I think there's a m much more complex view of, uh, not only of China than, than it used to be, but the American perception of, of the world out there and of East Asia has also changed. But I, if you don't mind, Matt, I'd like to get back to what Andy was saying, yeah. and, and, and not exactly disagree, but to point out, although this has been a trend going on for a while, uh, things have really uh, changed, or at least things look visibly different from just a year ago. Uh, and the way that China and the U.S. relate to each other uh, is in a, in a process of still very open-ended evolution. I mean, there are a lot of very simple prescriptions over the last several years of so-called China's rise. Uh, China was compared to Wilhelmia in Germany as an inevitably uh, unsatisfied rising power that would come into conflict. Uh, and a, a smaller number of people said, no, it was, China was more like the United States and Britain in the, in the uh, early 19th century, and there would be a kind of peaceful transition of power. It, uh, but, or third, that there was a kind of new Cold War emerging uh, between China and the United States. I, I don't think any of these necessarily are panning out. And yet it's interesting, we, we no longer hear so much about the G2, uh, which was a common phrase just a year ago, um, nor is there is that much talk about the conflict, uh, the coming conflict with China. So the, the relationship between the US and China is no longer necessarily one of condominium, the US and China sharing the world together, uh, or uh, one of conflict, um, neither allies uh, nor enemies. But one place where we can see this, and you know I was going to bring this up, is Korea. Um, uh, for several years, it seemed that there was a real convergence of interest over Korea. China was agreeing with uh, the U.S. proposals in the U.N. Security Council for sanctions over uh, North Korea's nuclear program uh, in 2006 and 2009. And then suddenly, last year, everything seemed to change. There were two major incidents in the Yellow Sea, um, the, the explosion in the South Korean ship Chunan, which killed 46 sailors, which China refused to accept was uh, the work of North Korea. Uh, and then the uh, shelling by the North Koreans of Yon, uh, Yonpyeong Island, uh, 
uh, which again, China has not blamed Korea for. So although the US has often said that China has a great deal of leverage over North Korea, which is theoretically true, what we seem to be seeing is the limitations of the US leverage over China. A as Andy was saying, getting China to agree uh, to be a responsible stakeholder does not necessarily mean it will agree with our interests and what we should do. And I think Korea is a, is a great exemplar and possibly a catalyst of a shifting balance of power uh, in the region. Uh, yes, of course, the U.S. is not uh, about to become a, 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 a tin pot um, shell of its former self, uh, but there is in East Asia, certainly, uh, if not other parts of the world, a relative shift in the balance of power um, that will only, I think, grow as time goes by. Just pull Richard in there. Uh, I'd like to pick up on that, but also I'd like to go back to um, the, the question of perceptions. Uh, it's not really uh, in, incumbent, on, I think, any of the Australians to comment on, on US perceptions of China, although I would say that, uh, particularly for many years in government, visiting Washington, talking about China, I was always struck by the difference uh, between the way in which we thought about China and the way in which, uh, the way in which the debate was conducted. In America, it seemed to be much more visceral sort, sort of a thing, and, 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 and people were, were very clearly uh, uh, labeled, you know, as either in the red camp or the blue camp, you know, the panda huggers or the dragon slayers, that sort of thing. Uh, it, very, very contentious in a way which was much, much less the case in, in, in Australia. An overall popular opinion uh, where China was concerned was, uh, was, was, was pretty much, I think you could say, overwhelmingly benign. Now, the interesting thing is that this has started to change in the last few years, yep. and polling has demonstrated this quite clearly. And that is very much a reflection of, of you know, the way in which China is being perceived because of some of the things that China has been doing, both internationally and, and, and for that matter, domestically. I mean, things like Liu Xiaobo, but not just Liu Xiaobo, for those who are more w well informed about uh, China, you know, the, 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 the almost routine brutalization of, of lawyers, journalists, anybody who gets, who, who gets out of line. At the same time as China is bringing enormous benefits to, to Australia, I mean, one of the reasons why Australia does not become as exercise as the US over the question of UN revaluation is because we have a very healthy, positive balance of trade with mm -hmm. China, which is both our major trading partner and our major export destination. Uh, and we are the only OECD country which came through the, uh, the, the, the recent economic crisis, the, the GFC, uh, without going into recession. And that is in, in very significant part due to China and our relationship with China. But notwithstanding that, you see this beginnings of a, well, not just the beginnings, you see a, a, a marked downturn in overall feelings about China, which reflects the growth of China's, uh, China's powers, as I say, some of the things that China has been doing, international activities that Andrew has already referred to. Uh, and we've had a series, particularly in, in 2009, we had a series of bilateral bumps uh, in, our, in, in our relationship with China. And this is also tending to make Australia's relationship with China a much more nuanced and more complicated thing than had been the case until, until quite recently. Now, there are all sorts of positives, and the economic thing is continuing to grow. You know, Chinese tourists to Australia becoming a, we're getting about twice as many Chinese tourists as Japanese tourists now. They stay twice as long and they spend more than twice as much money. You know, there are uh, uh, Chinese students coming to Australia. All these things are, are big and positive. They're not going to go away. But at the same time, there's a higher degree of caution. This also then plays in very much to uh, perceptions of where the United States stands. And so to see the president conveying some of the messages that he was conveying yesterday, I think is very welcome in Australia. I think one of the reasons why it's very important you get the protocol right and show due respect is that then enables you to convey uh, the tougher messages as well. I can see Andy Nathan wants to come in, but just before he does, let me uh, uh, take on a role that uh, Ian said he would uh, do earlier, and that is to briefly introduce Australia's Consul General to New York City, uh, uh, Phil Scanlon. Phil, would you like to just uh, stand up briefly? Mm -hmm. Very wanted to, uh, to do that not just out of politeness, but um, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the grand scheme of uh, uh, diplomatic representations at, uh, in, the, in the consular capacity, uh, Finley is extraordinarily uh, effective. 
um, uh, have a long career in business and various other things. Um, so if there's anyone here uh, who needs to know anything about Australia or connect up to Australia, Phil's your man. <laughs> Andy. So I wanted to uh, build on Richard's uh, opening there and to talk a little bit more about Australian interests in China and, and ask for our Australian colleagues to talk about it because I think in the US we tend to take it for granted that Australia is a close ally of ours and we sort of assume that they share as an ally all of our concerns with China, but of course that's false since they're a completely foreign people with strange, no, because they're in a different place. Uh, talk funny and uh, it is dangerous. I want to point out it's very dangerous that we've gotten to this point in the panel and Jeremy hasn't <laughs> said anything because we, we know Jeremy is storing up <laughs> criticisms <laughs> and so sarcasms. He's going he's gonna to blast me when he opens. But so we've just heard one of the important differences. The United States is concerned with its trade deficit with the currency jobs and all that while Australia is running a trade surplus thanks to sales to China and I think a lot of natural resource sales so that and, I, I think and, that and, that and education a lot of education yeah so, so the the natural resource sales which has the upside of producing a trade surplus has its downsides I think for Australians uh, I, I, I don't want to say I w I'd like to see if it does uh, you know, in terms of environment, in terms of whatever. Are there issues there? Um, when we're concerned about human rights uh, as a strategic matter, not only as a values issue, and the Australians feel the same way that we do, but I don't think they feel that Chinese human rights are a strategic concern for Australia, but rule of law there and the mistreatment of some of your business people and things like that and whether you can do business there might be a concern. But I'm particularly interested in the different visions of the Chinese naval expansion, the military picture. So for the United States, the growth of the Chinese military, its anti-satellite capabilities, its stealth aircraft, its anti-ship missiles and all that have a direct threat to the U.S. Pacific fleet and its uh, uh, not yeah, the Pacific Command and its mission of protecting Taiwan. Australia has no defense commitment to Taiwan. Australia has security interests in, do they? In, all right, tell me about it. In, in, in Oceania, in, in the larger Pacific. Okay, I want to hear about that. Um, so I think uh, Australia has a great concern with Southeast Asia, with Indonesia. You know, how do you, how do you, um, in terms of um, not just being a good ally or sympathizing with the United States, but in terms of core Australian interests, uh, how does China shape up for you? Also, is there an assimilation issue, I mean, of Chinese immigrants? Is, that a, is there an ethnic, an ethnicity issue in, in the minds of Australian people, which is one that I kind of think we don't have in the United States, and I could stand to be corrected on that as well. Are you for you? No, String of issues there. Have, have, um, have a play. Just, 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 yeah, Jeremy's going to come in, but just, just, for, just very quickly. I mean, on human rights, I think our views are very, very similar and very close to those of the United States. And human rights is always an issue in the bilateral relationship. You know, at different times it's been played in different ways. Uh, for a long time we have had a, a regularized human rights dialogue with the Chinese government. Uh, some people think that's just going, going through the form. I've been involved in some of them myself and certainly from the reactions some of the Chinese interlocutors you don't get the impression just going through the form. You know, in as much as they seem not to enjoy it, I think it's probably worth doing. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we do care. It's, 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 it's important. Uh, but it is one of, of, a, of a number of interests. And it's, I, I wouldn't say it's the dominant interest, but it's not an interest that's, uh, that's uh, forgotten by, by any means. Um, where Taiwan is concerned, I, I was going to say, if there were, if there were two areas where uh, the, the immediate sort of visceral nature of the, of, of, of the bilateral relations do differ, one is on this the question of UN revaluation. I mean, I think most of us think that the UN should be revalued too, but it just not, doesn't quite doesn't play the same role in the in the overall uh, bilateral uh, political 
an economic relationship that it does with the United States for the reasons that I've stated. The other, the other is Taiwan. You know, we don't have a Taiwan lobby in Australia. We have never had a Taiwan lobby in Australia. As Taiwan has become increasingly democratized, increasingly a model of how to be Chinese and how to be democratic, uh, as some, uh, some of my you know, Taiwanese uh, friends say, how to be Chinese and how to be happy, uh, <laughs> is, uh, that's, that's, that's important. And of course, it's a complicating factor too, because a democratic Taiwan is, is far less easy to write, to write off, oh, let, let the PRC have them, uh, than one which was being, being run uh, by the KMT in its more, uh, uh, more egregiously dictatorial phase. Uh, but, um, Still, it doesn't play the same role and has not played the same role uh, in the political mix in Australia. We, Taiwan does not have a strong lobbying capacity uh, in, in Australia. We do not have a military uh, or an alliance commitment to Taiwan, but we have our ANZUS alliance with the United States, which means if the United States uh, is under attack, uh, we are at the very least obliged to consult. And in, in real terms, that means you get, you get involved. One of the reasons why I think most people in Australia are very, very happy with uh, what's happened with cross-strait relations under Ma ying Zhou's leadership is precisely because the prospects for cross-strait conflict involving the United States has been significantly reduced because the last thing we in Australia want to see is conflict between the US and China. As, and I think that applies for most people in China and the United States too. I certainly hope, hope that's the case. Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia uh, Southeast Asia, of course, is important to Australia, but strategically it's <coughs> Northeast Asia, which is the most important, it's where all our major trading relationships lie, and it's where things can go most wrong in a security sense. Uh, Southeast Asia does not pose a threat. Yes, there was a threat of terrorism, uh, from, uh, particularly from in Indonesia. Uh, that has been dealt with to a significant degree, partly because extremely good rela relationships and cooperation between the relevant authorities in Australia and Indonesia, and for that matter, Singapore, Thailand, uh, uh, well, uh, Malaysia, and so on. Uh, but uh, Southeast Asia is nowhere seen to be, it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't account for the major economic relationships, nor does it pose a potential uh, existential threat. On the question of assimilation, I think the overall story of assimilation of uh, people of Chinese ethnicity in Australia over the last uh, 40 years or more has, has been a, a, a brilliant story. Mm. Uh, and, and there are simply no problems there. There was this stupid woman uh, um, who uh, you know, appeared briefly uh, in, in Australia some, getting on for what, 15, 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. 15 years ago? Pauline Hanson. Yeah, Pauline Hanson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, that, that was poss possibly the last gasp of a sort of Australia, which is uh, in most other parts uh, long, since, long since dead. And, uh, Jeremy, did you want to come in on any of these? I don't really have much to add, but just to say that we, like friends in America, have a very similar type of concern. We are caught between um, an economic relationship with China that is mutually imbricated and becoming more complex. And as we've just pointed out, Australia has benefited greatly from that relationship with China in recent years, so much so that we haven't felt the economic downturn that has been experienced by so many other countries. At the same time, the, the popular concerns for human rights, or well, values issues, human rights related issues is increasing in Australia. People have seen, and we've all seen under the, 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 the late Huwen period of government, um, the increased crackdown on independent voices in China, whether they're journalists or lawyers, mm -hmm. let alone the Liu Xiaobo and Charter 08, eight people. And this for Australians in the long term, pe thinking people, and I can't talk about Australians, I can talk about the people I deal with, with students and with um, what you regard as being the publicly in intellectually engaged people in Australia, are concerned that our country is so heavily reliant on, on a, a regnant or a risen economic power and one that, is, that behaves in a way that gives itself so little room to negotiate its own future. And that is a problem for those of us in Australia who care about such matters. And it's also one of the key concerns of the new center that we've established at the ANU, the, China, the Center on China and the World. And that is, as we contemplate a future in which the Australian economy, our strategic um, alliances, our regional concerns are so profoundly engaged with the, an expanding ch Chinese presence in the world, China in the Pacific, China in East Asia and Southeast Asia, these issues of not only values, but the issues of how China as a polity manages to negotiate its own future become pressingly important and relevant. So things that were once the province of specialists and scholars 
political scientists or cultural studies experts actually become issues of pressing concern for anybody interested in the future of, well, I'd say Australia, but concerned with the future of, um, of, of humanity as a whole. And that is that what we've seen in the last couple of years in China is this narrowing of opportunity within the Chinese system that does create a lot of concern among thinking people in Australia. If I could just add a footnote there in a way that links no, back sorry. to Madeline's uh, uh, earlier question <laughs> and, and Andy's about uh, Australian attitudes. Um, in, my sense is it's, it's evolved over the last, uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, over the last uh, ten, particularly three, four, five years. I mean, uh, ten years ago there was just this uh, great sense of economic opportunity. So it was all economic upside. Um, uh, and if you look at what the wider public was thinking, you can see it back in the opinion polls back then. They were, they were much more benign about China than about Indonesia. Mm. And it's, it's only in the... I mean, Richard would know this better than me. It's only in the last so many years, the public opinion polls, when we go beyond the policy cognoscenti and, 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 Je and Jeremy's thinking people, if we go to the wider public, um, uh, you see uh, changes coming in the last few years. Um, and my sense of uh, the sorts of things that have moved the public uh, it was issues like uh, uh, the Olympic torch um, uh, uh, episodes, particularly when it was in Australia. I mean, we all saw what was happening in different parts of the world, but it caught the Australian public's attention when it was in Australia. Um, and then... Uh, what uh, was the character of that particular episode in Australia? Uh, it was... Um, uh, 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 Chinese security forces coming in uh, uh, quickly and heavily uh, on a disruption to the smooth proceeding of the, uh, of the torch mm -hmm. carrying. And you could just see Australians watching it on TV. You could see Australian police. All sorts of people were just visibly taken aback. Right. By the Combined with the very heavy presence of thousands of patriotic Chinese, Chinese. students mm. who'd come bust to... In. And you understand, but bust in, you know, helped by the embassy that this massive mobilisation of, 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 of people suddenly occurred. Uh, I think the impact on some Australians was somewhat similar to the impact of the uh, sudden appearance of thousands of Falun Gongers outside Zhongnan High. How could this have happened? <laughs> but, but also seeing Chinese security forces pushing aside mm. members of the Australian Federal Police mm. to protect the torch had a profound impact yeah. in Australia. It was shocking. There's an invasion of sovereignty. In terms of what enters the public's consciousness, I mean, similarly, the episode with uh, an Australian businessman being uh, uh, apprehended, prosecuted and imprisoned, leaving aside the objective rights and wrongs of what was going on there, that really entered public consciousness. Um, uh, more broadly, I think, uh, I mean, I, I would say there's been, a, there's been a tightening up in Australian policy thinking about China. Uh, and this might uh, be something that uh, uh, draw, draws Charles in. I mean, my sense is that around Asia, around non-China Asia, you've sensed this a lot in the last several years, just increasing concern. And it used to strike me coming, coming to the United States that you didn't encounter the, the same degree of concern here. Uh, we'd interact with people at conferences, and uh, Australians and Indonesians and Koreans and Singaporeans and Vietnamese would be saying, hey, we're kind of worried about what's going on. And, and the reaction from the US seemed to be less so. But that's not what I sense now. And my sense is the last six months is a marked shift in the way people are talking and thinking about China. But I don't know if that resonates with, uh, with any of our panel. I think it is the case that the American perception, uh, both at the elite level, uh, the policymaking level, and of the popular perception is one of um, less certainty that China will engage in, in actions in East Asia that are in American interest. But I think the problem from the American point of view is, is how to respond to that in East Asia. What we've seen in the last couple of years is, is sort of falling back on the old patterns, reinvigorating the alliance with, with South Korea, with Japan. And of course, the Japanese and, and the current governments in South Korea is very much in favor of this kind of thing. On the other hand, economically, Japan and South Korea are so much more invested in China than they, they were even 10, much less 20 years ago, to say nothing of during the Cold War. So, so I think there's a certain um, <coughs> uncertain, there's a certain lack of re real, in my, as, as far as I've seen, 
careful thought about where to go in U.S. policy. Maybe Andy, you can address that in East Asia that um, that doesn't rely on the old uh, power politics methods that engages China in a, in an intelligent uh, uh, and forward-looking way, uh, and that also maintains America's interest in in the East Asian region. I also had a question for our Australian colleagues. Um, uh, about the issue of East Asian integration and China's role in it and the role of the other powers, the East Asian Summit, for example, and other sorts of, of intra-regional institutions. Um, how Australians view that now? To what extent is there a sense of a kind of exclusion or inclusion uh, within these organizations? Who was it that called the East Asian Summit Asia without Caucasians? Uh, and now that has that has changed somewhat to bring in the Americans and, and others. But I, I wanted to know what, what the view in, in Australia was of that sort of, of regional integration and China's role in it. Does anyone want to come in on that one? I'll say something again quickly, I mean, but that's an area that you're very strong in too, Andrew. So you just mm -hmm. I mean, Australia's always been very active in, in the whole question of regional architecture. You know, one of the, one of the attributes of a middle power, as is how we like to describe ourselves, is that you become more active uh, than you know, might normally be thought to be the case because you want to prove your worth and you want to help to try to shape, shape agendas in, in, in your own interests and not leave it entirely up to, the, up to the major powers and because you have at least sufficient to wherewithal to make some contributions. So we have always been very active in going back to uh, Australia's major role in the creation of APEC. Uh, and uh, most recently we've seen you know, Kevin Rudd's proposal for an Asia-Pacific community. Now many of us would see, and so maybe this is special pleading on Australia's part, but the expanded EAS, mm -hmm. which has included Australia and New Zealand and, uh, and India for some time already, we were always very keen to bring China into the EAS. And it, with the way that the, the EAS is kind of... Uh, sorry, it, you, uh, yeah. United States, beg your pardon. Um, how can I confuse the two on a day like <laughs> this? Um, but the, uh, to bring... What are you talking about? The e EAS? East yeah. Asian East Summit. Summit. East Asian Summit. Yeah. East Asian yeah. Summit. Yeah. 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 To bring, bring, bring the United States into the EAS, in, in fact, creates something very similar to Rudd's original concept for uh, an Asia-Pacific community. The trouble is that with APEC had got too big, uh, particularly with bringing in some of the Latin Americans. It's hard to run the agendas. Um, and because of the, uh, because of the, uh, <laughs> I speak Spanish, so you know I don't, I'm not making a <laughs> negative comment. Um, but uh, because of the conditions under which uh, Hong Kong and particularly Taiwan were brought into APEC, it meant that APEC could not discuss security issues, could only discuss economic issues. With the expanded EAS, you've now got a group of Asia Pacific countries which can cover all, the, all, the, all those bases, and it looks to me very much like what we want. And Australia is, is always going to, I think, could be, be active and in favour of a strong regional architecture. Yeah, let me just add a, a footnote there. I mean, Australia's never met a multilateral organisation, especially a regional one that it hasn't wanted to be a member of. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're big on these things, and as Richard says, that's what, uh, what so-called middle powers tend to be like. It's precisely because they can't shape the rules by virtue of their size uh, that they're keen to get others coming together to uh, have rules evolve, norms evolve. Um, uh, I, I would say uh, uh, for some years Australia's been concerned to try and uh, strengthen the regional architecture. And one of the things that uh, uh, I think was weighing on the minds of Australians and others is that um, looking back on it now, uh, if you remember back to the, the Asian financial crisis, the one before the global financial crisis, <laughs> uh, the late 90s, I mean, one of the uh, knock-on effects of that uh, was to change the way East Asia was relating to itself, creating a greater sense in the region, hey, we need to be talking to each other more effectively so that we can begin to get mechanisms to help make sure this doesn't happen to us again. And... Um, uh, China, through that period, was just extraordinarily effective, extraordinarily sophisticated and skillful in the way it was managing its regional diplomacy, uh, nurturing the coming together, not just China, but uh, China was closely involved in this, nurturing the, com the coming together of the ten Southeast Asian countries in ASEAN and the big three Northeast Asian countries, uh, Korea, Japan and, of course, China itself. And that uh, grouping, uh, ASEAN plus three, as it was, it was uh, loosely known, 
uh, really emerges as the most coherent and authentic regional body. And the, uh, uh, the problem for Australia is that uh, this is a body that is dominated by China, that the United States is not in. So we were always very keen to see a widening of that membership, as Richard was saying, mm -hmm. and were delighted to, uh, when the Japanese, the Singaporeans, the Vietnamese and others were keen to expand the membership to get uh, uh, India, Australia uh, and uh, New Zealand involved. And that's when Rudd then kicked in with uh, arguing for things going further still, and we now have uh, the United States uh, and Russia in. Um, but uh, I think that's a step forward for us. Um, uh, it means the US uh, is engaged uh, directly, formally, frontally uh, in what will be uh, the, uh, the, the primary piece of regional architecture. And that matters for us as APEC, because of its uh, huge membership, uh, has, um, has, has lost the momentum it once had. Um, let me just try and change the direction of the, the conversation uh, for a moment and tilt us uh, inside China um, uh, and, and, and ask the panel, given the breadth of uh, uh, different sorts of expertise we have uh, across the panel, uh, to reflect on major social, political, economic, if anyone wants to, trends inside China? Uh, and, and, and what are the sort of headline stories uh, you'd tell uh, an audience like this one uh, about the, uh, the main trends inside China? That seems like a good opportunity for the uh, raucous Professor Barney. Mm. Well, <laughs> well, from the point of view of uh, well, cause one of the, the topics that's so much um, in the news these days concerns the upcoming leadership of China and that related to um, the, the coming into power in the next few years of members of uh, the Chinese, what we call the communist gentry, the uh, what is called Taizadang in Chinese, but the princelings faction, they call them in, in English, but really members of a, of a communist era gentry. That is people like um, the Bo family children or those of Xi Jinping and so on and so forth. This is this interconnected um, group of families and affiliations that has developed since the 1920s and 30s in China um, with the growth of the Communist Party. This year, we're commemorating, I think, in many complex ways, the, um, the centenary of the, Chi the, the real Chinese revolution, the revolution of 1911, 1912, that saw the end of, well, f saw the formal end of authoritarianism and autarky in China. Some would argue that we're still waiting for that on the mainland. Um, but 10 years from now, we'll be celebrating or commemorating the 100th anniversary of the birth of the Communist Party of China. And that Communist Party, of course, has had a history that we're familiar with, but it's also led to the growth of this extraordinary group of families and their interconnections that have had such a, a powerful hold on the realities of China. So nowadays, it's very easy to forget that in 1989, when students in Beijing um, and then in cities throughout China demonstrated, um, well, first for better food in their canteens. That was one of the reasons they were demonstrating at the very beginning of the 1989 demonstrations. But also it related to a whole series of, of issues involving um, freedom of, well, freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom to be themselves, freedom to consume is a big, a big issue for many of the young people in the 1980s. That freedom has been realized in China, of course, since then. But also freedoms related to, to freedom of speech, media freedom in particular, and then to vague inklings and ideas of democracy. But one of the things that really caused the authorities deepest concern was that the young student demonstrators published in pamphlets a series of documents that tried to outline the interconnection between Chinese family, the Chinese Communist Party nomenclatura, that is the 200 or so members of the, the, um, the Central Committee of the Communist Party, its family affiliations and business connections. And this is those documents, which were probably unreliable to a great extent, were the first revelation since the Cultural Revolution of the internal ruling dynamics of China. Again, one forgets too easily that the Cultural Revolution in its earliest phases it began in 64, but the really intense period of its unfolding in 66, 67 was 
to a great extent, the popular explosion that led to the destruction of party mechanisms and the breaking open of the Chinese version of WikiLeaks, the breaking open of Chinese secret vaults of information and archives and documents, was because the masses felt that they were disempowered by a bureaucracy that only took care of itself, that intermarried and ruled through a series of closed and secret covenants. Anyway, all of that aside, just some background to those eras, the 60s and the 80s, are there, I mention them just because we will in the next few years see an extraordinary moment in Chinese history. Extraordinary moment in modern Chinese history, well, post-1949 Chinese history, because one could make similar claims about uh, Republican era, um, Republican era government in China, the family connections being one of the very things that brought an end to the, to the Republic in mainland China. And that is we will see the type of family gentry relationships come into the, into the public sphere in a major way. The, the presumptive future leader of the People's Republic of China, its president and party general secretary, Xi Jinping, is a member of the nomenclatura, the old party, the old party gentry, and many others of his, of, of his ilk will take their, one would, some would claim, and friends of mine claim, their rightful place as the rulers of contemporary China. And we will see reinstituted in China a form of um, patriarchal control that we haven't seen before. You know, it's very interesting that yeah. you, you talk in those terms because if you listen to some of the <clears throat> pundits on American radio and television, they're describing a very different story. Mm -hmm. They're thinking in terms of a new generation that grew up after the 1980s, doesn't yeah. have those kinds <laughs> of ties, and, and really are oblivious to the underlying social networks mm. that exist within China. Yeah. And I mean, it's easy to feel that way. If you go to China, you, so you see a kind of um, heterogeneity, a kind of complexity. There are so many different kinds of networks that one could belong to. And it's, and it's very difficult, I think, for, for people outside of China to to understand how these things actually function um, in, its, in its full reality. And, and also, it's one, this is where one of the, the elements of the, 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 the guided nature of the Chinese media also has a profound impact. In other polities and other societies, we would see the debate about family connections. People would be fascinated. Celebrity culture would reveal all the connections. But um, <coughs> We don't get those revolutions, the revelations of the Chinese press. You have to be on the inside in Beijing or Shanghai or Sichuan in Chengdu or Chongqing to have any idea of how this all fits together. But I, I, just to take that, my, my comment about the, the nomenclature and the, the gentry one step further, we've seen Xi Jinping quite recently, and I think it's, it's worth remarking on that he's part of that, not only that world, the Communist Party world, but also colleagues of his, the, the Bo family children, have themselves been pursuing, as you know, in Chongqing. They've pursued this sort of revitalized red culture, that is the revitalized Communist Party culture, to shore up a sense of Chinese nationalism with revolutionary tradition and a form of rather protean, some call it crude red fascism. I, I think that doesn't really help us understand things. It, 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 re, you know, it uh, ev evokes things that actually mislead us in our understanding. But to, one should appreciate, and I've done a lot of work on, on the nature of, of how Communist Party history, its literature, its songs, it, I, I did, its language, the way people speak and express themselves, reflect they are a culture in their own right, whether you like it or not. I don't particularly like it, but I find I'm familiar with it. I, I was a student in Maoist China, so I grew up with that culture. But this is a, a vital and meaningful cultural environment for those who live in it and manipulate it. Xi Jinping and the Bo family and the others will continue to pursue this as being part of a unique Chinese culture. And and, uh, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you, you raise it because it, it does help us start to uh, explain some of the things that seem unexplainable in the activities of members of, of the Chinese governmental elite. Mm. Um, because one would, if you take the view that there is an, an increasing complexity and, and power is distributed over a wide range, mm. You, it's difficult to understand why you get these dramatic responses to somebody like Liu Xiaobo. Or the Tibet question. Or the or Tibet Xinjiang question, or, or 
And, and I think, you know, I mean, one of the things that's been quite interesting, I mean, a lot of the members of the audience are, I, I, I don't know who is a longtime resident of the United States and who is a student who comes from China. But one thing I have realized that I think Americans tend to have a very naive attitude about is the, de the deep, deep sense of nationalism of a particular kind, even amongst people who are you know, extremely well educated, mm -hmm. have um, numerous opportunities, and you know, I think that there's a tendency for Americans to think, well, once, they, you know, once people get here and they understand how democracy works and they understand what's really going on and they read the history, that attitudes will change, and they won't necessarily change, nor, you know, nor would I say that they necessarily should change, but I think we have to recognize that 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 is there, yeah. um, because I think there is a kind of anticipation that somehow, if we just wait a few years, everything is going to change yeah. overnight. It's not going to happen. Yes, sir. On that, yeah. just parenthetically, uh, that um, you know, as, as against well, sorry, in the context of everything that Jeremy's just been talking about, in terms of broader intellectual currents, you know, those of us who. Who, who perhaps made a lot of contacts because it was easy and pleasant to, with the uh, predominantly sort of liberal currents in, in Chinese intellectual circles in the, in the, in the course of the 1980s, um, and might have expected those to continue in some shape or form, uh, find that they've not. Well, of course, one of the shapes and forms which they've continued is in exile. But meanwhile, back in China, things have been changing. And uh, to the point now where you know, the predominant uh, mode of, of thinking about things is, is a much more statist mode for the, you know those of you who know Chinese Guo Jia Zhui has has in many sense replaced liberalism statism replacing liberalism and Jeremy and I uh, organized a, uh, a seminar with some scholars in East China uh, in Suzhou late last year and you know, numbers of these were liberals themselves but we were lamenting the fact that it was actually uh, and this is not to do with the fact that the government is telling you to do this or not but this is in terms of intellectual currents and saying it's now embarrassing to confess yourself to be a, a, a liberal in many Chinese intellectual circles. So this is really just to further back up what the chair has been saying and what you've been saying. Well, on the other hand, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I do think that, that there is, you know, there is a great deal, I mean, I, you know, I can, you, you can remember also when we first started going to China, you could not talk to people about anything. Mm -hmm. People weren't familiar with um, intellectual currents in the West, things weren't being translated, and um, and now one of the astonishing things is the degree to which, and I, I see it almost as a, in parallel to some extent from to what happened in Japan. I mean, we as scholars in the United States have many new students who come to us from Japan and China, and we expect we will have to teach them theory. We will have to bring them, you know, the great corpus of, um, of our Western intellectual um, tradition. And they come to us, they know it better than we do. Um, maybe more than they should, be because it becomes almost <laughs> fetishized. Um, but nevertheless, there is a tremendous amount of intellectual mm. activity and, and questioning and and openness and people more willing to to debate issues at the same time. So it's I you know I think that it it's not a totally no, it's one of the pessimistic no no you know. it's not all I'm not all pessimistic. What's so frustrating, having dealt with the Chinese intellectual in particular for 35 years of my life, is that you have inc many of my best friends in China are incredibly intellectually active. They're amazing writers. I translate a lot of their work engage with the major issues of, of public concern, but they're not responsible for anything. No. Yeah. They're not stakeholders in their own no. society because they're not allowed to be by the patriarchal nature of the Communist Party's control. Mm -hmm. And that makes intellectual activity very different because it doesn't, it matters but doesn't matter. The public debates are engaged in every form of theory, every beautiful form of ratiocination and elegant expression can be engaged in. It is, a par it is an extraordinarily expensive and delightful parlor game. But nobody has any power to actually engage in serious social or political debate and change and a true contestation of ideas. And that for me is the greatest tragedy about a rising or regnant or risen China is we have a major 
new member of the world community that can contribute so much, yet it's, people, it's intellectuals and thinking people, though well-informed in every possible way, incredibly well-educated and engaged, in their own society cannot be engaged because of the nature of political power. Let, to let me, me just that's uh, fascinating. come in and say, pass the microphone, so to speak, to uh, Andy in just a moment. But bef before I do so, let me signal that in a minute I'm going to open up for questions, comments uh, from the floor. So if people want to uh, get their questions and comments ready. And I'm mindful that Madeline uh, uh, has to in a minute. Um, Not a minute, but a Shortly. Minutes. What my, uh, <laughs> uh, my late friend and, and, uh, and uh, colleague, um, uh, Chow Johnson, used to describe as go and commit pedagogy. Okay. Um, uh, so if anyone has questions for Madeline, I'll take the, that, that might be for Madeline. We'll get those earlier in the queue rather than later. Why don't we go right to that then? Okay. Yeah. Floor's open. Gentleman here and then gentleman there. And, he, and here comes a microphone, sir. I'd like to follow up on what was started uh, concerning uh, uh, June 4th, 1989. Uh, just a week ago at an event sponsored by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, one of the researchers from the China Economic Research Institute of Beijing University said that, quoted Wang Jiabao, saying that there were two causes for the June 4th events. One was corruption and the other one was inflation. Now. In Andy, we have someone who is an expert on the elite. And in Jeremy, we have someone who has talked a great deal with the students and the participants. And my question is, now two decades later, in a situation where we are told this is all forgotten, what in fact do we know now that we didn't know in the immediate aftermath and perhaps you can speculate, what are the implications for what we know now about the causes and the historical significance? No, but I, I think uh, that corruption and inflation, I mean, Jeremy mentioned a number of issues that came up, but I agree with the Premier <laughs> <laughs> that those were the chief drivers uh, and the sense as well that, I mean, connected to that, that, you know, that was after 10 years of Deng's reforms, and a lot of people felt that during those 10 years, these reforms are improving China, improving my standard of living, improving my career prospects, and so forth. And in 1988, the reform process stopped because there was a price reform, and the leadership, the, 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 they, they announced it, they took it back, they didn't know what to do, it triggered a surge of inflation. So there was a widespread feeling by the students that the reform process has hit a stone wall. There are hardliners who are preventing it from moving forward. And of course, as you know, the death of Hu Yaobang, who stood for that process in their minds, triggered these feelings coming out. So I, I, I think, uh, you know, 20, what, how many years later is it, 21, whatever, that we that's still a very valid account of the causes of the outbreak. And of course, the, the split in the leadership that then occurred where they didn't have a quick response, that's what allowed it to snowball. And I suppose implications for the future, if that's what you're asking, are that, and the regime seems to be very aware of this, is that inflation and corruption, a perception of inflation, corruption, division could cause that kind of snowballing unrest again in the future. In answer to Andrew's, one of the questions he was asking, I think, you know, it's a regime that faces these kinds of potential vulnerabilities, but which knows it, knows it better than we do, and is always taking measures to try to head off those kinds of events. Mm -hmm. So the situation is constantly transactional, but I don't see any um, uh, immediate indication that the regime won't be able to, to keep on skating on the surface of the situation. Anyone else on this question? Then, okay. So we need let's let's take. There's going to be a lot of questions. I already recognise the gentleman here. Let's take two at a time. 
and we'll let the panel play with them and I'll keep moving. Thank you very gentlemen much for here, a great... Gentlemen here that I'm heading up the back. Th thanks for a great panel and great moderation. My name is John Kotcher. I'm an alumnus and researcher. Uh, while Professor Zellin was watching uh, Rush Limbaugh, uh, I was watching Henry Kissinger on PBS, so maybe it's a question of choice of channel here. <laughs> In any case, Kissinger's message was very simple. Can we get the worldview right? And when you look at the disparity, in, not only in terms of culture, but you've got a 5,000-year-old civilization uh, looking at a 200-year-old upstart with different values, uh, throwing its, and a 200-year-old upstart looking at a 5,000-year-old civilization throwing its weight around the world, throwing its weight around, at least in the region. Um, on the one hand, a peaceful, uh, peaceful rise has rarely, if ever, uh, been consummated among great powers in, in the modern nation state system. Uh, whereas the United States, uh, Kissinger's point was that it's transitioning from being a primus to a primus and to Paris. The United States has never done that. We've always been either the superpower or a kind of a negligible great power, uh, a peaceful rise. Uh, now, with respect, so. Are these things, are, is it possible to consummate a worldview that at least is, is pointed in the cooperative direction? With respect to Korea, and here's my question, you have a perfect example, as has been noted, of a, an opportunity. But for China, Korea is a intrinsically, historically, and geopolitically critical power. Whereas for the United States, North Korea constitutes a proliferation threat and a, pot and a potential target. Do either of these powers see the other the way they view uh, this regime? Or at least the contradiction in the way they view this regime? So anyway, thanks. Thank you. There's a, there's a, a rich and pregnant question. Uh, Somebody just drop the microphone in? Thanks. Um, first, a uh, a quick observation, then a, uh, uh, a question really addressed to the panel, but uh, especially with regard to what Jeremy said. But first, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, I think Andy was talking about how during the first two years of the Obama administration, the kind of a, a, a kind of uh, not reacting properly to China or sort of cozying up to China, perhaps even, uh, that might have that might have uh, a thought uh, given the Chinese the idea that we're a bit more of a pushover than we really are. Uh, it's interesting that he was accused of doing the exact same thing with regard to the Republican Party at, at that time. The exact same line of, uh, of critique, they of a bipartisanship, et cetera, instead of really stopping there and not, and, and the transformation that you're talking about is, is also occurring precisely, and now that the Republicans control the House, it's, it's also occurring precisely in terms of, of, of internal domestic politics. So I think there's a broader uh, uh, attitudinal or cultural uh, transformation perhaps going on in Washington. Be that, be that as it may, um, the, 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 what Jeremy was talking about, the notion of a, uh, a kind of, uh, of, of, of an a, a elite group, an elite party group uh, uh, with its own, uh, uh, own history, own sub, uh, subculture, reinforced by all sorts of uh, important ties in Chinese society, kinship ties and and uh, uh, various uh, tung shui tung this tung that ties, a rampant tungism, but within this uh, 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 domain, uh, that goes in one direction. But there's another direction which, in a sense, doesn't necessarily contradict this, but uh, problematizes it a bit. That you've been hearing in the press lately about the diffusion of power in China. That uh, 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 that the president of China didn't know was 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 talking to Gates and didn't know apparently that the Air Force had just tested a stealth bomber. If he, yeah, uh, if I mean, to what extent are we dealing with uh, a bit of an operatic performance here? Yeah, but the the point it maybe they want to people want to encourage this idea. But in any event, that is a relatively recent theme. Gates wants to encourage. Perhaps that, but it is a recent theme that's been taken up by the press that uh, there is a process of diffusion of power among some of the major uh, 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 state enterprises, for example, the military and a variety of, uh, of others. Though the, my real question, I suppose, is to what extent, in fact, is the, is the very notion of coalition that you're introducing always based upon this kind of diffusion of power? Yeah, let me just say, as a historian, I would say yes. I mean, one of the, one of the things, I mean, I, I get very um, concerned when people start talking about 
you know, China with its 5,000 years of history as if everything has always been the same and uh, in America, we're always young. Somehow we're forever young um, <laughs> and reinventing ourselves. But, um, but, if, when it, but when you look at China, one of the things that I think can be um, drawn out of history and, and continues to, uh, to manifest itself in a whole number of ways is a tension between center and local. And it, you, know, you can think of all kinds of reasons for it because of the size of China, because of the population, because of communications interests, because of diversity of language and culture and so on. Um, because of the way in which the Communist Party itself distributed power. And I remember, you know, it's not a new, I, rem I remember in the 1980s, just as the reforms were starting, there were constant debates about whether or not we were going to de uh, distribute power to the local level or whether the center was going to continue to try. And, and if you look at legal reform or you look at economic reform in any of these areas, there is a constant struggle going on, which, which is a natural thing. I mean, in the United States, we, we built it into our constitution. Um, and indeed, in the, in the early part of the republic that Jeremy talked about, there were people who were genuinely debating whether China should not be a federalist right. system. Because perhaps that's the only way that a large continental empire such as our two countries are could operate. Um, so I'm not surprised. What, what does surprise me, though, is that in all our conversation about the, what the Chinese government and the Chinese elite think, what the uh, what Americans think, and I, I has you know I just want to reiterate that I didn't look for Rush Limbaugh on his own station. Um, <laughs> she also watches Glenn Beck. <laughs> no. That's all she ever watches, Limbaugh and Beck. Right. That's, that's, that's uh, grounds for losing your tenure, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> um, th but, but that, that there hasn't been much of a conversation about whether or not both sides are looking at each other's systems and the problems and internal tensions that they have and using them as lessons. I remember during the period when we were talking about stimulus, people would look at China and say, well, you see, for all its faults, the Chinese system can have stimulus. Now, maybe the stimulus wasn't in all the ways that we would have liked. Mm -hmm. then, then the Chinese look at our system and they see, you know, if you don't, know, if you don't control things, things can fly out of, you know, out of, out of hand. And so I wonder whether those kinds of conversations are ever, are ever going on, because there is actually stuff to be learned from both sides. So let me keep the conversation moving along, because there's a lot of questions out there. Charles, were you looking yeah, to come in? Just very quickly, um, I think, as I mentioned earlier, North Korea is a perfect uh, place in which to see this, this change, changing relationship. And um, the issues over North Korea last year really woke up a lot of Americans to the sharp realization that China and the U.S. have different interests in critical areas, uh, and that the U.S. cannot expect China to go uh, to follow its lead uh, necessarily. Um, and I think there are, there are more um, to come. Um, but I think what Jer uh, Jeremy said should also kind of shake up uh, or reflect something that should shake up Americans' perception of the U.S.'s role in the world which is that, that we can't remake the world in our image. And that is very difficult, I think, for Americans to, 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 to accept, as, as you mentioned. Uh, and, and since the end of the Cold War, uh, there's been a new life given to the idea that uh, everybody wants to be American. Uh, if the buzzword of the 1990s was civil society, everyone was going to become liberal democracy, China was just a little bit behind Russia that way. If, and if the buzzword of the 2000s was empire, the US was going to run the world in a unipolar way, we're, we're looking, I think, for a new uh, word to encapsulate the decade we're in now, perhaps multipolarity or coexistence of different systems, if that doesn't sound too That's Chinese. Too <laughs> <laughs> so in the interests of getting engagement from the floor, I'm just going to keep things moving, which will put a discipline on our panellists. I previously recognised the gentleman in the white shirt there, the red uh, kitchen down the back, and then the gentleman there next. We'll take those three and I'll keep moving it. Hi, good afternoon. And, and, the, and the rule is... There's no such thing as a stupid question, but there is such a thing as a long question. <laughs> sure. And that goes for answers too. Uh, mm. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shen Yi. I'm from City University of New York. I'm, I want to thank National um, Australian National University and, and Weatherhead East Asian Institute to have this kind of discussion panel. Uh, thank you very much. And my question is, the bilateral China and U.S. relation has become very important for international peace and prosperity. As China's President Hu Jintao says, China will continue to develop a positive, cooperative, and comprehensive partnership with the U.S. When China and U.S. relations face Taiwan issues, the U.S. continue to sell weapons to Taiwan. China's attitude is un unacceptable, unacceptable. Why does the United States continue to sell weapons with Taiwan? How could China and U.S. better each other's relationship with come to Taiwan issues? As President Hu Jintao visited to Washington, D.C., I remember he, he, he stated China and the, the United States should build mutual trust and, and respect with, each, with each, each nation's internal affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Down the back, sir. Um, I'd like to thank the Consulate General, the Chancellor, and, and all the professors from Australia National University. Um, America has no greater ally than Australia and friendship, and so I thank you for being here. Um, and I definitely would like to add my support to Australia while they deal with this flooding situation, which I know is baffling and, and troubling and has caused much problem. Um, I'll keep this question short. Um, what is the relationship right now w between China and um, Australia as they compete with um, a regional, the regional um, power play in Southeast Asia in particular? Coming forward, sir. I, uh, Chen Weihua from China Daily. Uh, my, my question is really, I mean, how if you put your, in the shoes of Hu Jintao and Jiabao, you would react to this conflict, I mean, hot issues differently. And my, I have an observation though. I don't think, I mean, I'm from Shanghai, so I, I think uh, Shanghainese and New Yorkers are much closer than New Yorkers with Rush Limbaugh. And <laughs> more similar, I would say. I mean, on many issues, I mean, in, even compared with anti abortionists you know, pro-life, whatever. I mean, I really have a comment also on, you know, I think really, you know, you're talking from Australians' interest, American interest, but you know, if Chinese talking only from their interest, you guys just going to bypass from each other. You know, you complain, you blame everything on China, you know, you have a trade surplus. I mean, you borrow too much money. I mean, China doesn't po point a gun at your head for borrowing its money. I mean, you, you com complain China doesn't s s consume much, but you never complain you never save much. I mean, it's like you complain China spent too much on military, but you spend like uh, then the rest of the world combined. So. I mean, this room, I'm wearing t I mean, shirt here. I mean, Shanghai classroom, you would wear, you know, down coat. I mean, it's the freezing coat. I'm, but people here still complain. I mean, Chinese consume too much energy. So, well, I think there's something seriously wrong. I mean, if everybody is just talking from their own interest, you know. There is a deep, I, I don't know, you heard this poem, which is widely circulated on the Chinese internet, uh, citizens, which is about, what basically is like what you want us to be. It's like, uh, when we do this, you want us to do that. When you, we do this, we want to So I don't know how you respond to this if you are Wen Jiabao Hu Jintao. Thank you. Three good questions. Colleagues, go to work, briefly. Madeline's off. I think the first question and the last question both really uh, are restricted to uh, the U.S. So it's not for me to for me to say. I mean, the question of uh, selling weapons to um, Taiwan. Oh, we don't do that. So that's a question for the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everything. China was, doesn't own our debt. We don't have any weapons. <laughs> Taiwan wants to buy. <laughs> and everything uh, from the gentleman from China Daily was directed to the U.S. Uh, as well because it doesn't apply to Australia. So in terms of Australia and China competing for regional, regional power play in Southeast Asia, I mean, that, 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 I think in a sense we've, we've 
we've almost answered that because this is precisely why Madeline, in thanks Australia very much. we have such a strong interest in developing appropriate regional architecture with which to address these these issues. We've got strong links with, with ASEAN. ASEAN has strong links with China. We have strong links with China. Uh, ASEAN has not been an area in which we have been uh, directly competing with, with China in any sense. Again, that partly reflects the differences, the different structures of our economies. Uh, and uh, we have not been uh, competing there uh, in, a, in a security sense, although the South China Sea obviously is an area of concern for us. Uh, the fact that um, some of our ASEAN neighbors are increasingly concerned over the degree to which other ASEAN neighbors are coming more under, in, 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 going more directly into China, China's camp, specifically uh, Laos and, and, and Cambodia. That's not something for, you know, that they're, they're sovereign states. It's entirely up for them what they wish to do. But nevertheless, it's interesting that people from other parts of ASEAN do comment to Australia on this. Uh, but I don't think we see it as an area of contention or competition with, with China directly. And if, if, if where, the, where there is, uh, where there are issues to be addressed, if we regard them as being best addressed within the framework of uh, regional architecture, both uh, economic and security. Anyone else? So um, on the two questions about the U.S. policy, it's not my role to defend U.S. policy. I uh, position myself as an analyst of international relations as they actually are. And if you want to know why the U.S., um, in my opinion, from an international relations point of view from a strategic point of view does the things that it does. I think I can explain that. But I, and I'm sure you already know. But I think what the two questions, underlying those two questions is a point I, I think I'd like to make, which is about how different the world looks when you're sitting in a different place. Now, one of the um, constant themes of American foreign policy is that others can trust us. Our dominating power means no ill to anyone else. And I think what we're hearing from the two Chinese questions is a very a similar point of view, that the rise of China presents no threat to anyone else. The Chinese are doing their damn best to you know, take care of 1.4 billion people, and they, they're not looking to hurt anybody. So there's this trust us point of view that comes from each side. But I think what's... Uh, interesting is that other people don't trust us and that other people don't trust China. Why is that? That's something about human nature. And one of the most difficult problems, I think, in American, one of the most, let's say, pervasive misperceptions in the United States is that American people and policymakers don't understand China's suspicion of the United States. China's, especially the regime, I mean, it's mm -hmm. also among the people, but I think that much of Chinese policymaking comes out of a conviction that the United States is out to undermine this particular regime and, and to undermine the power of China in the world. And, to, and they look at a lot of evidence, American policy in Taiwan. What is that about? In China's point of view, it's to undermine China. American support of Liu Xiaobo over the years. Somebody mentioned that the Chinese reaction to the Peace Prize was, what, what did you say, kind of irrational was not the word, but somebody said this. Overboard. You know, from their point of view, Liu Xiaobo was created by the United States with the explicit purpose of undermining uh, the Chinese regime. And uh, that stratagem enjoyed tremendous success in their view, you know. So, I think there's a great deal of distrust. I'm afraid that distrust is part of the international political system. Okay, um, let me just make an observation, then I'm gonna to point to some hands. We've had a whole a bunch of questions. So far, they've all been from men. If there's any women, they're gonna get precedence. <laughs> One, I have a woman on the two, panel answer it. Three, and then I'll come. <laughs> One, two, three, and then, sir, I'll come to you after that. Up here first, you were. 
Thank you. If, if, before I ask my question, if I could just say, you know, listening to Obama sort of welcome who in, in his remarks, it sounded like they had a whole list of prescriptions for Chinese domestic policy. And I thought, wow, it looks like all our problems in America are taken care of. Now we're going to move on to domestic Chinese policies. And I think generally in China, what I hear is like, hey, why does America get to tell us what to do? You know, I think there's a very strong feeling in that. And so my observation I would like to hear, uh, it's kind of a question, is that essentially the rise of China right now at this point in 2011, is that it's used international institutions and systems to sort of join them, like, like, the, uh, like the WTO and things like that. And it's gotten to a certain point where it's beginning to outstrip their power. And its influence is sort of outgrowing those institutions. Many of those institutions were created post-World War II. That was a world that, for the most part, the US helped create. And so what I see is essentially an end of the World War II world system. It, it, most generally. So essentially, we're seeing a need for a very, very large scale refiguring of the relationship of a major world power and its, and its entry into the world. And I think that unless there's political leadership on both sides to not just talk about that we need to talk, but real sort of, you know, like grand game, you know, large scale institution remaking that China needs, because China thinks it's taking its rightful place in the world as a major world power. It doesn't necessarily, I think, as it sees itself, want to rule the world, but it wants its respect as a world power. So I think the institutions have to be refigured to sort of think, how does China fit in? And if we do that piecemeal, I think there's a great deal of um, opportunity for misunderstanding and perceptions and sort of stereotypes to develop. And unless there's a very sort of concerted and articulated view about the need for a new world, um, it, there's going to be big problems in the, in the relationships of China and the world. Uh, thank you very much. I have uh, one question for Mr. Rigby uh, regarding the uh, East Asia Summit. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, of the uh, growing importance of this uh, forum for East Asia. And uh, um, uh, I was wondering, uh, how do you see the prospects for uh, expanding the agenda of the summit uh, as suggested uh, recently by the uh, Japanese foreign minister? And uh, the second question is about the, uh, no the importance of the uh, Northeast, of the greater importance of Northeast Asia for Australia rather than the Southeast Asia. And as a Mongolian, I would be interested in uh, your views on how you see the, the priorities uh, or well, the, the concerns uh, uh, that you have in, uh, you, you, how would you assess the, uh, in the scale of one to 10, where you think the non-proliferation issues are in the, in the set of concern that you may have about the, uh, the security in Northeast Asia. Thank you. And then third, um, the, yes. Yes, I have a question for Jeremy. I guess I was a little surprised, and then I, one for Charles. I, have, I was a little surprised uh, when you said that the people in China don't feel they can have any power on public issues because um, I was, I've been in China several times and had the opposite feeling among the young people, but also the netizens in China, the people online who are engaging in public discussion and, and succeeding in, in doing some things in terms of exposing public officials and corruption. So I wondered if you have you know, some sense of that and what's your response or if anyone else does. And for Charles, I have the question, I think it's helpful you point out the multipolarity. Uh, what I've seen um, recently at the UN is it seems that there's, there was Russia, China, and North Korea, and there was South Korea, the US, and Japan, or whatever. And so it seems that split is developing. Do you see anybody in the region who can help moderate that, who can help? I've, I've seen at the UN, surprisingly, some of the other um, nations that in chairing the, the UN Security Council, et cetera, acting to try to, to, to understand what's going on and see if they can diffuse some of that. I wonder what your perception is. Do you see any, any forces outside of that that can help diffuse some of the tension and, and bring us forward instead of going you know, to more, more crises? And in some ways that ties nicely to the first question as well. Panel, let's have a go and then we'll come back out for more questions. Let me just say we've got 15 minutes left and I'll try and get as much in in the, in the final go. If, if I may just quickly respond to that query about um, empowerment. Of course, the, the netizens' world is a very particular one. It does have 
a fascinating impact on public debate, in particular what, what, um, what people call in China also the, what are called aiguodze, as well as many other forms of netizen activity. The government China has a political environment which is fascinatingly influenced by forms of mass net democracy, or rather outspokenness on the net. That's a phony democracy in which those who speak most often and most loudly can be heard by the authorities and by within a certain strictured framework of social realities. Again, there's been a number of incidents in which corrupt officials and inappropriate activities have been um, punished by netizens, and that type of political activity is fascinating and may well grow over the years to come. My point was somewhat different, and that was that in for theoretically informed, engaged public intellectuals and active citizens have no way, except of course on the net, in minor cases, to enact their ideas in a public contested environment. That's, so it's somewhat different. My view of, is somewhat different of what the reality is. It is fascinating, as, as I point out, that um, the, ne the netizens on a whole, the growth of the Chinese internet, and I was the first person who did a survey of the Chinese internet for Wired magazine in 1997. And what has happened is very much what we thought then. And that is that the net has actually given the more extremist views, just as it has everywhere else in the world, of individuals a greater weight within political debate or political consideration, rather. I don't think there's such a thing as political debate in China in, in such crude terms, can't be put in such crude terms. But extremist views have been given greater weight. Um, views are going to go back one step to 1988. You might remember that TV show called Hushang River Elegy, which itself much praised and criticized by authorities, but much praised as being um, a harbinger of change in China. If you look at that series very carefully, you will see a type of nativist um, patriotism and anti-foreignism that runs through the whole series that has just been articulated with greater strength over, over the following years. My, my problem is that just diversity of opinion and openness and contention of ideas in the public realm is what will make China a far more interesting place for all of us. I'll leave. Charles. Yes, uh, again, very briefly, the World War II system, or more precisely the the immediate post-World War II system, um, the United Nations, uh, Bretton Woods, and so forth, has been dying for a long time. The problem is there's nothing be that's been able to replace it. And China wants to be part of this, uh, of, of some emerging system in which it plays what it feels to be its rightful role and is recognized as such. Uh, China is, of course, a member of the Permanent Five of the UN Security Council. I heard Hillary Clinton um, a couple of days ago refer to that uh, in, in, uh, the, the, on the, in the subject of human rights and saying, as a founding member, of the United Nations, China should subscribe to human rights, neglecting the fact that the U.S. prevented Beijing from taking that seat for 27 <laughs> years. Um, <clears throat> uh, but you know, it's it's it wants, I think, in particular, to be recognized in the economic fora. Uh, G20 is something uh, WTO, but not, you know, it doesn't feel it has its voice in IMF, World Bank, and other sorts of institutions. So that. That's changing slowly, but it's very difficult. It's a remarkable how enduring this post-World War system has been, and no one seems to be able to think of a good way to break that up completely and replace it with something else. Inclu uh, one of the most vexing questions has been the UN Security Council reform, which, of course, China has been a major proponent of preventing from happening. Um, so uh, uh, now, as far as multipolarity um, and who can mediate in Northeast Asia, uh, ASEAN would like to play that role, uh, but uh, the, the players within the region uh, don't seem to really give it the space to do that too much, although it has to some extent. It really has to come down to direct dialogue among the powers involved, um, and that has had limited success, but the alternatives all seem to be worse than that. Anybody else want to come in? Let me just add a quick footnote um, to your question about uh, global institutions. I mean, broadly, I'd say there's two ways of thinking about it. One is the existing mix of global institutions are just flawed in conception, mission, and purpose, and need to be rethought, um, from as far as China's concerned. Um, the other is to say, no, the purpose, missions, etc., cetera, uh, uh, remain valid. Uh, it's just they don't give appropriate weight uh, to China's views. Um, I'm much more of the second view than the first one. And I would say this goes beyond China. China's not the only one who has these concerns. There's a whole range of um, you know, uh, the, the, the big emerging economies. Um, uh, and uh, I may be a notch more optimistic than Charles on this. 
Um, I mean, I think there are changes uh, coming in the pipeline with both the IMF and the World Bank. Um, uh, I think G20 is the single most important thing that's happened in global uh, institutional arrangements in quite a while. And China, and particularly um, uh, emerging economies, particularly Asian emerging economies, uh, tremendously represented. It's a big shift away from the Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, the slowest uh, area to move, uh, my sense is, is the whole United Nations. Uh, architecture, and that relates to a whole range of other veto players in there. Um, here's what I'm going to propose. Uh, Andrew, I've not replied to the ladies' questions. Yep. Please. Um, Sorry, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> My apologies. On the East Asia Summit, prospects for expanding the agenda. I mean, Australia's vision is for a broad agenda. We want to see the East Asia Summit cover the full gamut of political and economic issues. Uh, that's, that's the simple answer. Uh, where if Japan has suggestions, you can be certainly sure that Australia will take them very seriously because of the closeness of our relationship with Japan uh, and the <coughs> fact that you know, we, have a, we, have a very, uh, we have a continuing high-level dialogue with our counterparts in Japan on the whole range of, of regional issues, both political and, and, uh, and economic. Um, but of course, in the end, it's going to depend on other members of the organization as, as, as well. In terms of Northeast Asia versus Southeast Asia, my comments were not meant to underrate in any way the importance of Southeast Asia to Australia. Of course it's important. ASEAN is, is very important as a, as a partner, and uh, Indonesia in particular as an as a, as a enormous neighbour, uh, and a country which has undergone a major process of democratisation, uh, is, 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 is of great importance to Australia, and in fact a big, a big <coughs> plus to Australia that we have the sort of relationship with Indonesia that we now do. However, the fact is that our, of our four major trading partners, three of them are in Northeast Asia, China, Japan, Republic of Korea. The other one is the United States, and the United States, as Jeremy says, is closely implicated in, in Asia, particularly in, in, in North Asia. So that, uh, that cannot be ignored. In terms of security, there are only two uh, issues that, you know, hotspots that could possibly, we hope not, but could possibly lead to conflict, which could and would involve us, and that is things going wrong on the Korean Peninsula and things going wrong in Taiwan Straits. So both from an economic and a security point of view, that has, has got to be a major focus for us. Non-proliferation, of course, is important. Australia has been very active in non-proliferation over a long period of time. Uh, Gareth Evans, uh, as you know, is, is, is continuing, is coming towards the end of a, of a, of a major um, uh, work that he's, that he's been, been doing. Uh, but as foreign minister, he, he was also extremely active in that regard. Uh, our, some of our concerns over North Korea, of course, relate very directly to, uh, to the question of non-proliferation. Uh, so that's where I'll leave it. I know Phil Scanlon has to leave. Phil, thanks for being with us. Um, we've got five minutes late, uh, left. I've already recognised... Thanks, Phil. <laughs> I've already recognised the gentleman with the striped jersey, and then I'll come to you, sir, and uh, Hello. up the back. Okay, thank Please you. keep them really short. Okay, thank you. I'm a student here, and I might be one of the few people here who are not interested in Tibet, Taiwan, and Tiananmen. My questions are about the perception of Chinese multinationals. Lately, there seems to be growing concern about the Chinese companies, for example, in the U.S., in Australia and some other countries. For example, the national security concerns towards Chinese uh, telecom equipment companies and some other companies. So I'm wondering to what extent, to what extent these uh, concerns are legitimate and what do you think are the reasons behind these concerns? And uh, going forward, do you think these kind of concerns are going to get stronger? Thank you. My question actually has to do with the human rights issue that you mentioned early on. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists, is the direction that China is moving in the right direction? And, and let me preface by saying the following. Uh, like the gentleman from, from the Chinese news, I came from Shanghai as a child, grew up here in New York. Most of my, my families uh, and the families that we knew all ended up in New York. And we all live in the Upper East Side and we're all related. So in 1983, I was invited by the Minister of, Foreign, uh, of, of Financial uh, Finance in Taiwan to speak about venture capital because I was the first Asian to own his venture capital firm. When I arrived in Taiwan, I asked, What's the, how is the Chiang Kai-shek's health? They immediately said, you cannot use his name. I said, you mean I can, you have to use President Chan? Now, I said, you mean I can't use the Chiang Kai-shek? They said, no, 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 you can't use his name. I'm related to the guy. My brother-in-law is his... Uh, uh, father is his uh, nephew. 
So my point is, in 1983, did we complain about Chiang Kai-shek and Taiwan? And was he our SOB and the Chinese leaders are not as our SOB? Today, if you go to China today, I'm sure any one of us, Chinese or otherwise, can ask the health of Ho Jintao and we're not getting into trouble. So where's the double standard? Thank you. I would like the panel to answer Professor Zelin's question. Is there a block for US policy and maybe Australian policy to learn anything from China? And I thought the particularity was, I disagree a bit with the panelists who said the netizen movement is not fundamentally profound. I think the netizen movement is tapping into a, a level of democracy unseen before in history. And I think that the Chinese government has found a way to facilitate it as well as to try to control it. So I wonder if there is, my question is, is there a block in particular in facilitating netizen activity in, the, in their countries here in Australia and in the United States? I'd love to take more questions. We can't. We've got to get our president off to talk to your president. Um, your, your favorite 60 seconds worth of thoughts uh, for uh, any panelist that would like to. Uh, you know, a perception of multinationals in Australia is not so much elect uh, electronic communications so, so far, but there's been certainly issues over Chinese investments in resources. Now, foreign investment in resources in any country is always sensitive. And we had a, it was a big deal when the Japanese started wanting to invest in, in, in our resources in Australia 20, 30 years ago. We, we got over that and we, we derived great benefits from it. Uh, last year, the year before last, we were going through similar things where China was concerned. Uh, there are specific issues where China is concerned because generally you're dealing with state-owned enterprises, so there are questions about the degree to which these state-owned enterprises are, in the end, answerable directly to, uh, to the Politburo. Um, when you look at their overall international behavior, they, they appear to be behaving um, you know, largely like any other competitive uh, corp corporations, but there are questions. So these bids get looked at. But I think the crucial thing to bear in mind here, and this is something that messes constantly with the Chinese, since um, uh, November 2007, the Chinese have put in at least, probably more since I last had these figures, but at least 160 uh, bids for investment in Australian resources. And of those 160, only five were subjected to a degree of conditionality or, or having other circumstances added to it. Not a single one of them has been rejected. People will continue to ask questions about these things, but, 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 but it, is, it is happening, and it, and it has to happen. Um, I have a point to make that's tangentially related to all three questions that were raised and to this question of diffusion of power that was mentioned earlier. I think the, the distribution of power, this power structure in China is intentionally designed in a way to be different from that in the United States or Australia. It's not diffusion or weakness. And there are two attributes I would point to in particular. One is that they empower specialist agencies to do their jobs, and that includes the security agencies and the military, where the central leadership says to the security people, keep security, do it the way that you need to do it. And they have a very large security apparatus, which is very skilled at doing everything that they need to do from soft things to hard things, and that often produces human rights violations and the central government has no mechanism and doesn't want a mechanism to supervise, oversee, prevent, check and balance the security guys doing their job the way that they professionally believe that they need to do it. If it involves putting Liu Xiaobo in jail, that's their professional judgment. A second interesting feature of the Chinese system, I wouldn't really call it decentralization, but the empowerment of local party secretaries to do whatever they need to do to keep the economy growing, to make sure that people don't create social disorder, to make sure that the population growth doesn't exceed the target. And to get that job done, the local party secretary is given control of the police, the women's federation, the courts, the media. And different party secretaries will handle that job in different ways, partly the difference of their personality and partly the difference of the local challenges that they face. And some of them will be very nice 
populist, consultative, and have a happy, happy time and get the, all the targets hit and go on in their career. But if they face a turbulent local population, if they face an, uh, the need to seize people's land, if they face parents who are angry because their children have been poisoned by lead and they don't have the budget to fix that problem, then the local party secretary may just have to crack down on people. And if that's what he has to do, that's what he's going to do. This doesn't mean weakness of the system. It's a kind of strength. But those do create human rights abuses. Jeremy, I don't quite understand the question about the internet and blocks. Sorry. Block. What does the word block mean? Let's uh, pursue that one after Probably the formal yeah. session ends. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Charles, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, just one uh, r relatively uh, minor point. The subject came up earlier of uh, how Americans perceive China and what we might learn from China. Uh, for what it's worth, there seems to be a sudden surge in interest in this country of how Chinese mothers raise their children, <laughs> which I think says a great deal about American anxieties about where we are right now and how we view China. <laughs> well, just before I invite you to thank the, uh, uh, the panelists, uh, let me, on behalf of my ANU colleagues, uh, pay uh, 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 tribute and thanks to uh, uh, Professor Myron Cohen and, uh, informally, Professor Carol Gluck, who was also helpful in uh, getting us together for this event. Um, we at ANU, as I said at the outset, uh, uh, are keen to explore possibilities for some sort of structured collaboration with the Weatherhead uh, East Asia Institute. If any of you have ideas for, th for that, uh, I'm sure uh, Myron, or Carol or others would be happy to hear them and I'll be collecting ideas from, from my colleagues. But uh, uh, for now, please join me in thanking our five panellists.